Hey, it's Chaz again. Welcome to another Jumpstart devlog. This devlog took a long time and marks the end of the prototyping phase and into the alpha phase. We're nearing the finish line. First thing I worked on since the last devlog was first person animations. Yeah, I know this is not a first person shooter, but with low res games, there needs to be a way to tell the player what they are using or doing by making a large high resolution asset somewhere on the screen. For example, Fire Emblem on like the GBA might do a close up for battles and then like pull out for the small sprites. And other games might put detail into the user interface to make like one small pixel look like a big uh, gun or something. I came up with an idea to utilize the bottom half of the screen like I was before with the car sprites to play highly detailed animations of the player actions. I created animations for aiming, firing the weapon, reloading, healing, opening the item box, and picking up the gas can. Essentially anything that the player does that interacts with the world is going to get an animation now. To create these animations, I used a phone holder that can go around your neck, and I mounted it to my body and then I put some old airsoft gloves on and took pictures of my hands holding objects doing these actions. I would take photos against a pure white background so it would be easier to cut it out later in a paint editor. After taking the photos, I'd pass them through a 1-bit filter called Pixatool. I got it on itch.io. And then I'd use varying levels of brightness and contrast in those filters so I get these like multiple layers and that way I capture all of the details. Then I'd down-res the image to around 180 pixels so that's slightly bigger than the rendered screen space. And finally, I added a single black pixel border and then a single white pixel border so that it'll stand out against the black background of the game. Once I finished editing all of the frames of the animation, I would add them into the Unity Animator timeline and edit the poses. I also made sure the curves were constant so that the animations weren't smooth because that doesn't happen in pixel art games. They need to be pixel perfect. So I made sure that it was like a little jittery, give that retro feel. I didn't plan on dedicating so much time to making these animations, but after I made one, I realized they were essential to the game's style and juiciness. If you're asking yourself whether or not your game needs juice, you probably don't have enough of it. Uh... The next thing I had to tackle was the sound system. Luckily in high school, I wanted to be a SoundCloud DJ. After messing around in FL Studio, I wanted to square away the code for the sound effects before I started making them. I started by writing up the documentation for a singleton pattern sound manager, which would control a Unity audio mixer. In Unity, the audio mixer can control separate audio channels, just like you can in any digital audio workstation or the true beat eds call them DAW, like DAWs. So I created separate mixer channels, one for game audio and one for music. In code, I don't let the player control the decibel level directly since they might accidentally hurt their ears. Whatever input the player has from a skill from zero to one, it'll clamp it to that range of decibels I allow for. While this next little bit is somewhat redundant, I made a wrapper for audio sources called a sound entity it allows any script to request a random sound or a random pitch shift on a sound before it is played. If you only make one sound for making a footstep and you hear it over and over and over, it could fatigue the player. So it's good to set in a bunch of random sounds. And if you can't do that, then you just pitch shift it a little bit so that you hear some variation. And with that, I could start making sound effects for the game. I decided early on I wanted to keep things simple and find a quick and easy solution so I didn't waste too much time making sounds because it can really be a deep rabbit hole to get into. The first option was to use something like BFXR. If you haven't heard of this, this is a tool to make 8-bit style sounds quickly. One of the first things I ever started using when making sound for games. However, I knew I wanted to make music in the same style as my sound effects, and I knew it'd be difficult to keep these two things consistent with each other. After some research, I found a free plugin called Crush 
Crush by Tritic. Essentially, it will take anything I make in FL Studio and bit crush it. However, when I use this asset, it tends to get rid of all the high end or any high notes. So I would have to layer in the original sound back in to get the original feel that I wanted. Here's an example of what I would make before crushing it. And this is what it would sound like after I crush it. So then it gives that effect of playing a Game Boy where the sounds had to be compressed so much that you couldn't even hear the original audio. To get the sounds I use to make these effects, I use freesound.org. In order to track which sounds I could use quickly, I created this spreadsheet using some import XML functions where I would just copy and paste the freesound links into it, and I'd instantly pull what type of copyright license it had. And for a quick rundown, ideally you wanna have a Creative Commons Zero license so that you can use it without needing to credit the artist. Anything above that, you'll need to find a way to credit them in some way, especially if it isn't really altered in any significant way. Even though this game bit crushes it so much, it'd probably be unrecognizable. I wanted to make sure that I was using these licenses properly. For the zombie and player noises, I would just make the noises myself. I also decided to make the audio sources spatial so the player could hear which direction the zombies were coming from or where the car is. Here are some samples of the final sound effects in the game. Similar to the sound effects, I started making the music by first creating the music manager. Music in the game will progressively get more intense as each day passes, and then it'll reset itself at the start of a new week and change the track. Ideally, there will be four distinct music tracks for each week and seven different layers of the track that will change each day. In order to play the right music, the game master will send a request to the music manager to play the right track using the current day and the current week. For making the music, I used the same bit crush sound from before to create cohesion between the sound effects and the music. To make the melodies in the track, I don't actually know anything about playing the piano, so I just threw some chords together and used pads because I love pads and they always sound spooky. After that, I slowly layered in a drum pattern that builds up with hats, snares, and kicks as the days increase, make it sound more intense. The final cherry on top of it was adding these one-shot effects with crazy amounts of delay and reverb. Here's the final arrangement all put together.
Next, I worked on the Unity Mixer to make the music volume duck under the game volume anytime a loud noise is played. The last thing to do was make an option menu to control the music and sound volume. I made this slider that changes the volume levels and it'll be remembered for the rest of the game's session. However, since I haven't worked on saving and loading files yet, the volume resets when you close the game. One major thing I love about survival horror games is the results screens. They show you how well you did and give a ranking after completion. I haven't yet decided on how to rank the player's performance, but I knew for sure that I wanted to track statistics about the player's run and make them shareable. The stat tracker will keep data on the following attributes of a run. How many days they survived, the play time, number of enemies killed, shots fired, knife kills, damage taken, and health used. Essentially, anytime one of these events occur in the game, they will call the current singleton instance and add to the stats. For the playtime, I made sure to only start counting it when the game was in progress and not when the game was paused or loading. At the end of the game, the text is displayed in a win or a game over screen depending on how you did. When there's a game over, the player is getting eaten by the zombies. In the win state, I haven't made a new graphic, so I'm just reusing the title screen art. Finally, I added this feature to copy and paste your run stats into your clipboard for easy sharing. And this is what the end result looks like when you paste it somewhere. The last important feature I needed was the upgrade system. It was really important that I get this in. It increases the survivability of the player once I start adding harder enemies and harder levels. The player will be able to upgrade their character at the end of each week, but only if they have an upgrade item. The player will need to find a new item called the Upgrade Schematic. Once the player picks it up, it adds one upgrade to the item Master Singleton, and they can spend it later. If the player doesn't explore to find the item, they won't be able to upgrade. However, it is guaranteed to drop once every 7 days. Next, I made the art for the upgrade canvas. Keeping with the theme that all the UI is realistic looking, the upgrade interface is the main character holding a notebook. Again, I made this art by taking pictures of my hands holding a notebook and filtering it with Pixatool. Next, I created the buttons that on click, check whether or not the player has enough upgrade points to buy it. If they do, the button is replaced with a check mark and the upgrade is applied. These upgrade buttons use inheritance and I just need to change one function to make a new upgrade button. If I come up with new ideas for upgrades, I can add them in easily. The entire upgrade system is based on the character data that I made in the first devlog. I made a scriptable object called character data and weapon data. They hold stat information about a character such as their health, action points, animations, damage, range, etc. The upgrade system will make changes to this character data file being used for the current run. However, upon death, the character data will be reset to the default character file. The reason I decided to do upgrades like this is so that I future-proof my code for serialization. If the player ever decides to pause their run or close the game, I should be able to just save the character data file to memory so then they can pick up where they left off later. The last touch I added to the menu was to add the player's cat in the background. Again, this has to do with the story which I won't spoil. Every time the menu appears, the cat will appear from behind the notebook. And of course you can pet the cat. Now that we are caught up, I can show a little of what I'm currently working on. I started reworking the zombie AI since they seemed a little unfair and too simple. They would instantly chase the player if they were in proximity, and I thought that it didn't feel good for player strategy. I started by making a new debug view that lets me view the state of the actors and the maze tiles to get a better idea of what the AI was doing. I wanted to make the new AI exhaustively search the maze using the same algorithm that was used to build it. Essentially they walk continuously in a direction until they're forced to stop. Then they randomly choose a new direction. If the zombie runs out of options, they retrace their steps backwards until they find a location they haven't yet looked. Then, they repeat this process until they have explored the entire maze. If at any point the zombie has line of sight to the player, they will immediately forget their path history and chase the player. It is possible that they can lose sight of the player in the process and resume looking around. To make sure the zombies were still dangerous, I made it so that they will spend an extra two turns chasing the last time they saw the player. This increases the chance the zombie does not lose track of the player. Then I added player and zombie hurt reactions to make it feel better to attack them. I also animated the health bar portrait so it felt more dynamic.
The last thing I started experimenting with was palette swapping. Using Unity's post-processing, I found a method to change the color of the entire screen using color lookup or LUTs. I don't know anything about making LUTs since I don't own Photoshop, but since my game only has three colors, it was easy to brute force it and figure out how to make one. Since I only have three colors in the game, my spectrum is really simple to look at. With this, it became very easy to make new palettes and colors for the game without changing any of my art assets. Ideally, I want the player to unlock these palettes by completing achievements for the game. The other option is to make different palettes for each location in the game, like the desert, the forest, and the city. I'm not sure which direction I'll go with it, but I'm happy that it was easy to get working. The game is starting to come together. I find myself getting carried away with work and it's difficult to prioritize these devlogs when I'm so close to being feature complete. As far as the timeline goes, I'm somewhat on track with my 3 month deadline but I probably will go over by a few weeks. The aspect that takes the most time out of development is making these videos but they are equally important to the project as making the game itself. Thanks again for watching and keep making games.